or you invest in certain types of investments such as indexes that capture the performance of the market overall. You can say certain things about the market. You can say over a period of time the market has done this or that and, and, and among those statements you can make is one I've made earlier today and that's that, that you know, the, the market has consistently gone up uh, in broad-based New York Stock Exchange definition or American Exchange definition. Uh, Dow, uh, Standard Poor's, whatever. Those are true statements and, and there's a historical basis for that. But if you're saying, no, I can do better than that, you may. And, and I know, no doubt if you or I do do that, <coughs> we'll quickly attribute it to our genius. But, but what, what the statistics show is that we were in fact lucky. And if we keep trying to do it, we won't keep outperforming it. So if you accept this theory, then it does dramatically affect the way you, you manage your funds. It, it, suddenly you, you start asking yourself, why am I paying these brokerage fees? I mean, what, what are you spending? What percent of your return is consumed in transaction costs? If this theory is correct, if you can choose a security or a range of securities and avoid these, these regular transaction costs, then, then whatever that percentage is, whether it's 2 3%, you can just tack it on to your rate of return. Just, just like that, you have an additional 3% rate of return and have no harm as a result of it. So, so th this, is a, th this is something that, that I know sounds radical to you. And do some research. You'll find that what I'm telling you is true, that this is understood inside the industry, though the brokerage houses, as you might imagine, for, for reasons that relate to their self-interest, uh, you know, are not proponents of this theory. But, but it's, 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 it's fully recognized and accepted by the best and brightest in the industry. I just have to tell you that. And, and once, you, once you accept what I just described to you, it's going to dramatically change how you invest and it's going to add points to your portfolio that's just lying on the table available to you. It's saying that you're wasting your, your money in these transaction costs. Or if you're focusing on a particular sector of the industry, that may make sense. <coughs> Excuse me. It may make sense, but there's risk involved. In that, in that particular industry overall. But it does, it does have you not trading in and out, and it certainly has you doing no day trading. I mean, day trading is just nonsense. But, but all the theory is based upon is the fact that, that the information that's available is generally available. And, to th and think about it for a minute. For, for you to think that you or somebody you know in the workplace who's going home every evening and sitting down with their charts, it, it, for a moment, do you believe that they know more than the, than the MIT and Harvard MBAs and Wharton MBAs who are congregated on the top floors of these towers in every city in America whose full-time job is to do this analysis for various pension funds and mutual funds, etc. Do you really believe that there's any chance that Bill down the street is going to figure out something that they haven't? And they're all dealing with the same numbers. They're all dealing with the same facts. Now, if you say, well, gee, perhaps there's insider information. Granted, if there's insider information, then, then that does disrupt the theory. But for the most part, we know that's illegal now, and while it does happen, it doesn't happen very often. We saw how harshly that was dealt with in the Martha Stewart case. So, so most, most people recognize now, particularly in this very regulatory environment, that that's a way to get burnt, is, is to trade in inside information. So let's put that aside for a minute. Everybody's dealing with the same data. All the bright people have the same charts. And I'm just suggesting to you that it's naive certainly naive for you to believe anybody you know is going to outsmart it, but I would argue that any particular person in a particular tower, particular office, is going to outsmart that market consistently. If they do it for a period of time, they're called geniuses, they're lorded on the shows for a while, but they always fall out of favor over a period of time. Um, one final point <coughs> that I would make when you're, when you're talking about uh, uh, portfolio theory. It's based on the fact that you have efficient markets. Now, let me take that concept, though, and apply it to real estate and show you how the, the argument is not made for every industry. Um, imperfect markets are really the opportunity for, for profits, and that's where there's not the same information that's available to everybody, where, where there, there's not a centralized exchange and, and this sort of digital communication of, of data and, 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 and other such information so that it can be assimilated and incorporated into the stock. And now, to, to contrast that with something that, with a market that's almost antithetical to that, is um, I won't even use residential real estate, I'll use commercial real estate. Now, there the, the gulf is vast between these two markets. Now, contrast what, what we just described in New York Stock Exchange with what happens in the typical city with a commercial real estate market. Think about how dramatically different they are. Commercial real estate is traded among 
you know, a handful of, of, of guys who do this full time in a given city, or maybe it's not a handful, maybe it's 30 or 40 guys that, that do this full time in a given medium sized city. It's lar more in a larger city. But these guys send, they fax information back and forth. Uh, they call up people when something comes on a market. I mean, it's the most primitive example of, of transactions of a marketplace that you'll find in the 21st century that involves so many billions of dollars. And is there more opportunity in this environment that I just described where, where you're counting on those very informal processes to transmit information than and with the New York Stock Exchange with securities? Yeah, there's a dramatic difference. And, and there, there, I do think there is much more opportunity, for example, in a commercial real estate market. Now, the point I'm making to you is not that you need to go buy commercial real estate. I'm just trying to contrast these different investment environments to make a point. Uh, you can't make the, 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 the argument about a random walk theory or the efficiency based on the efficiencies of the market with everything. It, it's not true in everything. It's, it's true in certain markets, and, and securities exchanges is certainly one of those. And, and over time, I see the, the real estate industry over time becoming a more closer to a perfect marketplace where they, everyone is dealing with the same information. But, but remember, real estate by its nature is very, very different. Every piece of real estate is unique, if you think about it. No two pieces of real estate on the entire planet are fully identical. But they, they all have some qualities that are different. That's the nature of real estate, even raw land. So it'll never be quite the same as a security which is more fungible. And as a result, I think there will be perhaps these more, more uh, isolated pockets of information that, that can be utilized and leveraged in ways that you can't in, in fungible uh, transactions or fungible markets. So I, I just gave you that example to, to, to further bolster my argument about the securities markets. Uh, for those of you who want to wander into commercial real estate right now, you got to have a strong stomach for that and you have to have, uh, <coughs> you have to be really good at what you're doing. You have to know, know what you're doing. I've, I've traded some in, in office buildings over the years and, and it's something that you, you have to be prepared to go into and you have to deal with negative cash flow um, and, and you have to certainly have brokers and others involved to understand the local dynamics of your market, etc. So uh, I, I'd be very reluctant to recommend that market to somebody who's, who's looking to place their IRA fund somewhere safe. Anyway, uh, with that I'll conclude, but I hope that this discussion was helpful to you. I, my, my objective was to give you some encouragement, first and foremost, and secondarily to give you a different way of thinking about the marketplace. And hopefully this is going to affect the way you interact with your stockbroker from here going forward. And in conclusion, I'll refer you to one book a book that uh, I think it's called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And the author, his last name is uh, Malik, M-A-L-I-C-K, I believe. I'm doing this from memory. A wonderful book. This guy is a professor at one of the universities, maybe it's MIT, but he's written this book that's really regarded as a Bible uh, to those who are on the inside of the investment industry. And it will really open your eyes to, to what I just talked very superficially about in this discussion. Well, with that, I think we'll conclude this episode of Cash Council. I wish you well till we get together again. Take care.